We've been looking at the web server side of things so far. Now let's switch back to the client side and uh, learn about WS import, which is a tool we used to generate client stubs previously. We did a WS import early in this tutorial series where we used a free external web service and a you know, Vizdil associated with it that was available online. It was just a random choice. But now we will switch to our own web service and write a client for the web service that we have written, which is the TestMart web service. We already taken a look at the WS import utility that comes with the JDK. When you run WS import with the Vizdil URL, it creates some handy classes, which are called stubs that hide the, the web service calling complexity for you. You just call a method on this generated class, and then that class does the complete web service call and gives you the response as a return type. So the stubs have one method for every web service operation. So calling any web service operation, making any web service call is literally as simple as calling a method on that generated class. There are a few things you can do while WS importing that uh, helps you customize how the tool generates these stubs for you. So we'll take a look at some of those options now. So open the command prompt and navigate to a temporary folder. Any folder will do. We're just using this to generate the classes and then we'll copy it to our Eclipse workbench. Uh, we've already seen the basic command. It's WS import, options, and the Vistal. The options here is optional. There are configuration options which change the way WS import behaves, but at the very minimum, you need to enter the location of the Vistal. The location could be a web address like HTTP, some web application.com slash web service, question mark, Vizdil, or it could be a local file on the file system. Both would work, but I would definitely recommend using the first approach, right? Using an external URL whenever possible. So make sure whenever possible, you use an external HTTP Vizdil URL as an input to WS import rather than using a local file URL. We'll take a look at why in the next tutorial. I'll copy the Vizdil URL for our test mart service and run WS import. Now the tool passes the Vizdil and generates all the necessary types. So here it is generated two directories containing the classes. This is because of the two package names. Now let's say you save the Vizdil file on your hard drive and run WS import. Do you think that'll work? Well, let me save the file here. I'll save the Vizdil file to a local directory, which is the same directory that I'm running uh, WS import in. It's the same directory that I'm already in. So I'll run WS import product catalog dot Vizdil. Notice that it still works. Now, why am I mentioning this? The reason is that the Vistal file, the file that I've saved locally just now, is not the complete web service definition. It's only a part of the web service definition. If you remember, the Vistal file refers to types which are in a separate XST file. So I didn't save those now. I just saved the Vistal file. But WS import is actually smart enough to detect that, right? It starts with your local Vistal file, but then if there is any references to XST files, which are in HTTP locations, it looks that up in their right HTTP locations. Now let's take a look at some import options. You've already seen the directory option, dash D, that lets you specify the output directory where you want the generated classes to go. And we've seen the dash keep option, which lets WS import to save the source files. By default, WS import deletes all the .java files after it compiles them. But if we use the dash keep, it saves the .java files also. And then you have the dash s and the directory. Dash d lets you specify the directory where you want the class files to be saved. And dash s directory specifies where you want the source .java files to be saved. As you can imagine, if you use the dash s option, it'll automatically turn on the keep flag. Now, there are a couple of uh, other obvious options here. You have dash verbose, which makes the tool give more detailed output and then the dash quite, which gives little output. These two do not have any effect on the output classes themselves. They're just the uh, console output that gets generated when the tool runs. 
Now let's take a look at a couple of options that do affect the output classes. There is a dash p package name. Now take a look at the output classes that it's generated by default. They're in the package arg.kaushik.javabrains because that's the package that I wrote the web service in. Of course, I did some overrides. Uh, I specified the package name com.testmart and all those have gone to the com.testmart package. Basically, it's the package that the web service belongs to, right? So what initially happened was when I deployed the web service, the package was picked up into the WSDL as namespaces when the WSDL was generated. Now when I'm running a WS import, that is again automatically getting picked up as package names by the WS import output. So it's all linked. But if you need to override this during the WS import, you can change the package name of the generated classes by using the dash P option. For example, if I use WS import dash P, uh, let's say org.kaushik.generated as the package name, right? So the classes will all be over here. The tool forces all the packages uh, to be of the specified package name. Next, let's take a look at the dash B parameter. Now, every program that generates Java code carries with it kind of like an implicit responsibility. The responsibility that the code that it generates has to compile. Uh, as we've seen, WS import generates Java code and it compiles it. So can this tool, the WS import tool, guarantee that the code it generates will compile fine? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't provide that guarantee. Uh, we'll take a look at the code that WS import generates later, but as you can imagine, it uses a lot of names as type names, same as what is used in the Vistal, right? The class names that it generates, it copies the names from the type names in the Vistal. So an XST type name becomes a corresponding generated class name. Now in some areas, Java is stricter when it comes to names than XST. XST is a bit more forgiving. So when you run into cases like that, we have a problem because some names that might be valid in XSD might not be valid on the Java side. So when WS import generates the code using those names, the resultant code will be generated. The Java files will be generated, but when it tries to compile them, you get a compile error. The resultant code will not compile. So like I said, the common problem is with the type names. You can have multiple schema types that use the same name. But when they end up on the Java side, when they get converted to corresponding Java classes, if they end up being in the same package, well, that's a compiler error. The compiler is going to complain. So to avoid this problem, you can use what are called as binding files. So binding files are XML files that let you specify custom overrides to the way the code is generated by WS import. You can override certain names. You can override certain ways in which the code is generated. I'll not be going into the details of binding files, but I do encourage you to look them up. You can do things like configuring a specific XST type to have a specific Java class name of your choice instead of the default XST type name. You write all these uh, overrides in an XML file, which is the binding file, and then you supply that to WS import with this dash B option. So you say WS import dash B, your uh, binding file name, and then your Vistal file as usual. And uh, there are a lot of customizations you can do here. The dash P option we saw before lets you customize just the package name, but this dash B option lets you customize a whole lot more. And it's very handy when you have, you know, troublesome visual files like this, which leads to Java classes which don't compile. Okay, so in the next tutorial, we're gonna take a look at two more options related to the WSDL location that you should definitely know about. They are just a specific problem in the way the Java client works, and we'll understand what that is. See you in the next tutorial and thanks for watching.